third year of your OBGYN residency. One of the things I liked the most during the nine years I was here was the fact that by the time the residents came to join the Eurogyne service, you already knew how to take care of a patient, and that made our job a lot easier. You know how to write orders, you know how to do an HP, you know how to do an exam. So really all we need to do to get you comfortable with Eurogyne patients is to go over essentially a Eurogyne history of present illness. Everything else when you see a new patient is the same as it is if you're just seeing a brand new GYN patient. There's just a little bit of a nuance of, of the information you need to capture in your history of present illness. And then of course there's a few details on the exam that we'll go over at another time. The, the, the uh, evaluation of pelvic floor disorders you look at any diagram of pelvic anatomy, you've got the pelvis and you've got the bladder and the vagina and the rectum all in very close contact with one another, and they're all supported by a bowl-shaped arrangement of muscle underneath. And uh, the uh, ACOG, or yeah, I guess it's ACOG uh, flip charts that are in most of the exam rooms, they illustrate that fairly well. The point is that all of those organ systems the bladder, the reproductive system, and the uh, colorectal function, as well as the musculoskeletal function, are all closely related, and the symptoms tend to overlap. And so your goal in your history of present illness when you're seeing a new urogyne patient is to capture the symptoms uh, from each of those organ systems, and that helps you sort out where you need to focus to help that individual patient. So referring back to that diagram, there's the bladder. And the bladder has three functions. It has to fill, it has to store the urine, and then it has to empty the urine. And uh, the, the, the normal physiology of micturition, uh, think of a baby's bladder. The baby's bladder just relaxes as it fills. The baby has no idea what's going on. The bladder gets to a full state, and then there's some stretch receptors in the bladder wall that signal the nervous system and say, I'm full, and the nervous system in a baby says, okay, contract. And so the bladder squeezes while everything underneath the bladder, the, the muscular, uh, musculoskeletal, uh, the pelvic floor, and the muscles in the urethra, they relax as the bladder contracts. And so there's always this reciprocal arrangement in bladder storage and in bladder micturition. Keep that in mind as you start sorting out symptoms. So with the bladder having those three functions, it has to fill, it has to store, and it has to empty. And each of those functions has symptoms that go along with dysfunction. So once again, hearkening to the baby's bladder, as the bladder fills, it should stay relaxed. The patient should have no symptoms while the bladder's filling. If the filling stage is not functioning correctly, types of symptoms that patients get we call irritative voiding symptoms or overactive bladder symptoms and they are frequency, urgency, uh, nocturia, or dysuria. Those are the main ones. Frequency. So what is frequency? Anything over eight times per 24 hours is considered excessive. Urgency is that constant disrupting sense of needing to go to the bathroom that affects their quality of life. And so the way I'll often approach a patient is they'll say, does your bladder bother you? Does it run your life? Are you constantly looking for the bathrooms? That is called bathroom mapping. Uh, They'll know what you're talking about if you ask, and that's what they have to do. So that sense of urgency that disrupts their life frequency more than eight times in 24 hours. Nocturia is greater than or equal to two times per night. So people getting up once a night, that's still considered normal. Two times or more at night, that's falling into the category of overactive bladder. Dysuria is a burnish thing when you urinate. You don't know what you're talking about. So. These symptoms suggest that there's something irritating the bladder that's disrupting that normal, steady relaxation as the bladder fills. That tends to give the bladder 
It, it, it fires the, the afferents to give the patient a sensation that something's irritating the bladder, and it can even activate the efferents and cause the bladder to start contracting. The filling stage symptoms really don't incorporate leaking urine yet. That's the next function of the bladder, is to store the urine that it's, it's received. And so the, the typical questions to, to start that series of questions, I'll simply ask the patient, uh, do you leak urine? And if the answer is no, well, you're done, move on. Uh, but if they say yes, the, there's two main categories of symptoms that you want to uh, distinguish between. One is stress urinary incontinence with a cough or sneeze or laugh or exercise causes the patient to leak urine. And uh, the, the other most common form of symptoms is what we call urge incontinence, urge urinary incontinence, where the, the question I'll ask there is, do you have trouble making it to the bathroom? And it's, patients know what you're talking about. They'll sort it out for you pretty quickly. But there's often overlap between those two sets of symptoms. So you want to quantify it in some way. And so you want to ask, is it daily? Or how frequently do you have these leakage episodes? And to get an idea of the severity of it, are you requiring pads? And if they say yes, you want to know what kind of pads and how often they change. Uh, and, and that puts these two categories into pretty good perspective. If they really don't have a lot of irritate avoiding symptoms, and they only leak when they cough, sneeze, laugh, or exercise, you know you're pretty much into the stress incontinence uh, uh, symptom course, and that's going to kind of guide your exam and your further treatment after that. If they have a lot of irritated voiding symptoms and they can't make it to the bathroom several times a day, they require two big mini or maxi pads, uh, sometimes more, they're constantly bathroom mapping, well, you might want to think twice about jumping to surgery right off the bat. Now, there are other forms of leakage that, uh, that, that patients can have. Uh, an elderly patient may have functional incontinence where she has a, a normal sense of uh, an urge to go and she simply can't get to the bathroom in time. Uh, that can be pretty common and so that's why I lead this type of questioning by saying, do you have trouble making it to the bathroom or can you always make it to the bathroom? Uh, kind of a middle of the road symptom that doesn't really help but is very common is Patients will say, well, yes, but it's when I'm in the bathroom and I'm pulling my pants down before I can get seated, I have a few drops of leakage. I've been at this 15 years. I still don't know what to do with that. Uh, note it and move on. So <laughs> the other issue, the other function of the bladder is the emptying phase. So we talked a minute ago about how the bladder has to squeeze while the outflow tract has to relax, and that needs to be a coordinated fashion. Uh, there are neurologic disorders uh, that fall under the category of detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, where the bladder will contract and everything else underneath doesn't relax. That can create an outflow obstruction which interferes with that normal gradual emptying to completion and then everything reverses and the bladder relaxes and the outflow tract contracts. So other things that can cause dysfunction with the emptying, uh, if the bladder's not contracting well, the patient may not, uh, may, may not be able to empty as well. If the patient has a lot of prolapse, the theory is that if this is the bladder, this is the urethra, and the bladder's prolapsing down, that can create an outflow obstruction with a kinked urethra, uh, which we often see corrected with appropriate surgery uh, for the patient's prolapse. But keep in mind what's supposed to be happening. The bladder is supposed to contract, the urine is supposed to flow out very easily with no additional effort, no valsalva, no position change. It should just empty while the patient just relaxes and then everything should complete itself and there should be no leaking afterwards. So those are the symptoms you ask about. And I'll lead into this category by saying when you get to the toilet and uh, you sit down to go, do you have any trouble emptying your bladder? And the things you're looking for specifically are hesitancy, meaning the, the flow doesn't start right away, intermittent stream, 
valsalva voiding. Sorry about the writing. Uh, post void dribbling. Position change, that sort of thing. Anything to suggest that the bladder doesn't empty the way a baby's bladder would empty. So when you cover these three sets of symptoms, you've pretty much nailed anything that can go wrong with the patient's bladder and the symptoms that derive from it. So at this point, you're half done. The other organ systems, I'm going to erase a little bit of this so we can move to a different category. Other organ systems, you have a GI system, the patient has to be able to defecate. You're worried about pelvic organ prolapse, is anything falling out? And then you're worried about musculoskeletal pain and sexual function. And so the categories that I'll usually move to here, after I finish the bladder symptoms, then I'm interested pelvic organ prolapse, category number four. And so that is any prolapse of the bladder, cystocele, pro prolapse of the rectum, rectocele, prolapse of the apical compartment. Uh, we'll talk about all of these things a little later uh, when we talk about the POP-Q system, but the symptoms of anything, any prolapse, any uh, pelvic organ uh, uh, loss of support, the symptoms the patient will have are a bulge at the introitus, a sense of pressure or heaviness, back pain that seems to get better at the end of the day, uh, a sense of something falling out, now if they say they have a bulge, I'll usually pause there and ask them to quantify how big it is, and I find that fruit works pretty good. Is it the size of a grape? Is it the size of a plum? Is it the size of an orange? Is it the size of a grapefruit? Um, take your pick. But they'll usually know what you're talking about if there's a bulge that comes out past the introitus. Now if they have a sense of pressure or heaviness and they feel like there's a bulge there and they say, no, I really can't put any, uh, attach any size to it, what, they're prob what you're probably going to find on exam is some prolapse, but it's still going to be above the hymen. Uh, you can get these same symptoms of pressure and heaviness and even low back pain uh, with prolapse that's less than stage two and may or may not be something that needs surgery. Uh, but if, if, they, if, if that concept of the size of a bulge resonates with them, you know you're dealing with some pretty significant prolapse. So the next category is uh, defecation. So just like the bladder has to fill and store and then empty in a coordinated fashion, the rectum has to do the same thing. We just don't spend nearly as much time on it because we have colorectal colleagues to help sort things out and the patients usually come to us over these bladder symptoms. But uh, the, the things you want to know about a patient's defecation are frequency and two or more per week. Sorry. <laughs> Two stools or more per week is technically normal. So if a patient, that, that's the, the question I'll ask first, just to get a baseline. <clears throat> then you want to know if they have any sense of constipation or diarrhea or both. And if they say both, you want to immediately think possible IDS. And I usually take that opportunity to ask if anybody else has evaluated any of their bowel symptoms. Uh, but if they say constipation, you need to know what do they mean by constipation? Is that just 
uh, less than one stool a day, or is it actual difficulty passing the bowel movements that they do have? And so if they have trouble passing a bowel movement, we call that defecatory dysfunction. And just like in the bladder symptoms, if they have to valsalva or change positions, uh, we consider that voiding dysfunction. Whereas with defecatory dysfunction, we want to know, do they strain? Do they change position? Do they have to put their fingers anywhere? And that's literally how I'll ask the question. You have to put your fingers anywhere, particularly if you've established that they have a bulge, because if there's a rectus seal, the stool can come down and miss the turn in the anal rectal angle and get stuck in a rectus seal. The patients sometimes figure out that if they push the bulge back, it redirects the stool. We call that splinting. And they will either look at you like you're crazy or look at you like you're the smartest person on the planet and say, how did you know? Um, straining, change position, splinting, uh, or digitalization, which basically is self-disimpaction. And so that's why I start the question with, do you have to put your fingers anywhere? Because if they say no, you don't need to go down either of those paths. But if they say yes, then start sorting out, well, exactly where do you put your fingers? Do you place your fingers on the bulge that you told me about? Do you place your fingers between? The, uh, the giant in the rectum, and I would just note perineal splinting, and uh, you'll, you'll get all kinds of different answers, uh, but they'll know what you mean if you ask them if you have to put your fingers anywhere. Then you also want to ask about any anal incontinence. Now, part of your, the rest of your history of present illness, you've gone through all of their obstetric history, you know how many uh, deliveries they've had, you know whether or not they had forceps, you know how bad the lacerations were. Uh, in fact, if they had something along those lines, that actually may be their chief complaint. In this case, you would be going down this uh, category of symptoms first. Uh, but it, you do need to make sure whether or not they have any anal incontinence. And if they do, frequency, I mean, meaning how many times a week, do they have to wear pads for that? Is it just gas? Is it gas and liquid stool? Or is it solid stool as well? Uh, uh, just go down a standard HPI line of questionings for if they do say they have any anal incontinence. Uh, at this point, you've usually established enough of a rapport with them that you can look them in the eye and say, do you have any pain? And so the last category pelvic pain or colloidal function. Uh, they're sort of separate categories and yet I still kind of lump them into one to make a nice even six categories for all of your urogyne and HPI. If they're in pain, you need to chase that down and see exactly where it is and under what circumstances. If, depending on what uh, defecatory symptoms they gave you, you may already be kind of suspicious if they're talking about pain up in their abdomen it probably has a lot to do with their GI uh, function. Whereas if they're talking about pain down in their pelvis, then you want to try to correlate that with, with uh, coital function. So I'll usually at that point ask, are you sexually active? And if the answer is no, well, you're done. If the answer is yes, then I usually just say, do you have any difficulty? And if they say no, you're done. If they say yes, it's usually some kind of dyspareunia uh, in which case you want to know if it's entrance dyspareunia or deep dyspareunia. Is it cyclic associated with their menstrual cycle? Uh, is it positional where certain positions hurt and others don't? Uh, and of course, do they leak any urine when they have intercourse? I usually save that category of symptoms for last because by the time they've answered all of this, they feel like they can tell you anything and you get pretty solid information. So I find that if I cover these six categories, three of which have to do with bladder function, the pelvic uh, prolapse, defecatory function, and then musculoskeletal and colloidal function, when I finish those lines of questioning, I'll ask the patient, have we missed anything? And uh, I've never had a patient say, well, I forgot to ask this or that. So this has stood me in good stead over the years as a urogyne history of present illness and uh, combine this with what you already know how to do with a standard history and physical, and you'll be ready to go grab your staff to do the exam.